Good morning. That means half of you are with me. It's good to come into the house of the Lord together, isn't it? To open our hearts before Him. I'd like to share with you just for a minute and a half, uh, one or two personal items on Karen's behalf and my behalf. Let's see. Husbands get in deep trouble when they forget something that's real important to the husband and the wife. What do they call that? Anniversaries, Anniversaries that's right. <laughs> they get into deep trouble. I have to admit, I missed it. I missed it. Not my wedding anniversary. I'm still married. But I miss the fact that last week was our one year anniversary with being with the church. And I want to say on behalf of Karen and myself, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be with you for this last year. I also want to give you just a moment's insight um, to my life in the year before that. For about 20 months ago in 21 months ago, in January of 2015, my mother went into the hospital in Minneapolis. I flew back to be with her for about two weeks. They diagnosed her with stage four melanoma, which is cancer that had spread through her body. In June of that year, after serving as 11 years as region director, what in the world is a region director? Region director is something that's in a region doing something and directing. You can talk to Pastor Greg, and he'll probably tell you the same. He'll be with us next week. Um, the region director coordinates the work among 24, 25 churches spread from uh, Ridgecrest to Santa Barbara. After 11 years of doing that, and uh, three selection processes, the Lord said, it's time for you to do something else. And uh, so Pastor Greg assumed those responsibilities, which retrospectively was just the Lord's right timing. I was scheduled to fly at the end of June down to San Antonio for some ministers meetings. The day before I was to fly, I flew out to Denver for a week to fly um, to San Antonio. The night before, I got a call that my father was in the hospital um, with chest pains. So instead of going to San Antonio, I got on a five o'clock flight to go to Minneapolis to spend about 10 days with him to return home and figure out what is going to go on. In between times, there was a, a certain time of, okay, I'm going to be doing something, but I know not exactly what or where, which doesn't concern me too much because God always provides in his time and in his goodness and in his graciousness. When Pastor Gray had a talk with me, well, would you be interested in assisting the Santa Clarita Church? I said, yes. And it's been a wonderful space to be with you. It's been a space of a space of time to collect amidst the whirlwind in my life and all of the chaos uh, to be able to travel back to be with my mom. Uh, as you know, she passed away in July of this year. As I reflect on our year together, we've had at least seven families that have lost people in their immediate family or their extended family. Uh, so it's been a time of coming alongside them, a time of assisting in uh, helping them work through some issues and healing. So please remember them in your prayers. I thank you for uh, coming alongside our family as you have and look forward to um, doing continued ministry here in a way that will move this church forward. The community has grown uh, since 2000 from 150 to 200,000. This church has birthed two other churches you may not know. If you're new to the church, it has active ministries in prison ministries, in family promise, in providing worship services twice a month to your children, and we're on call to assist your family and your needs. We have over 100 people coming to our church that are not church members, but using our facilities. Um, in uh, We 
we have a little patch of earth, daycare, that uses our facilities. So we're networking in our community in more tangible ways. So please continue to pray that our, our effectiveness on behalf of the Lord will be effective as the Holy Spirit uses us to reach hearts and touch lives for the gospel. It's an amazing thing to be part of that, isn't it? To think that God calls us, to think that God died on the cross, to redeem us in all of the ways and complexities of life and sinfulness that we find ourselves in at times, He still invites us to be used of Him to invite others. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? Let's pray together. Father, we've gathered here to worship you, and as we do so, Lord, we, we go humbly to your scriptures. We go humbly to your scriptures to uh, learn of the lessons that are written there, that we might apply them to our lives, that we might be moved by your Holy Spirit, that we might be more effective in reaching others with your gospel of good news. So, Lord, bless us with the presence of your Spirit, Touch and move our hearts, Father, as we worship you this morning. I ask in Christ's precious name, amen. Sometimes it happens so quickly, you don't even know how it really happened. Have you ever been in a, what they call a car accident? How many of you have ever been in a car accident? Now, hopefully it wasn't your fault. Surely it couldn't have been your fault. Actually, neither driver intended for it to happen, did they? That's why they call it a what? Accident. You hope the other, the other driver will get out of their car and quickly say, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. I have good insurance. Are you hurt? No, thank goodness. All of the metal and the glass and stuff can be repaired. Here's my phone number, here's my insurance, and we'll work through all of that. That's probably the best outcome, isn't it? Your car goes to the shop, you get a rental car in a month or six weeks or however long it comes, takes, it comes back looking as if it was never in a what? Accident. But life isn't always that way, is it? There's an old, old story. Sometimes it's personal things we do, and sometimes it's things we do as families and as groups of people. It's a story that you probably have heard. It's about the Hatfields and the McCoys. I couldn't quite figure out. I printed it off the web and I got lost in the details. I started to follow through. The gist of it is they had a dispute, a disagreement, and you were either part of the Hatfields or you were part of the McCoys. You were either with them, or you were against them. And it was either us, or them. And in the end, that which might have started out, which something that was perhaps easily resolved, and understood, and respected, ended up with loss of life. It's a terrible thing, isn't it? When you stop and think about it, that we live in the land of America, a land of freedom, a land to think differently. But we so often get into group think, don't we? How is it when we have four, five, or six people around us? We do something like this. Did you hear? What? I don't know if I heard they don't say. 
but their eyes light up as if to say, tell me all about it. I'm all ears. And out comes the story, a little enhanced, a little exaggerated, believable, because a dime is not too thin, but that it has both sides, but you're only going to see one of them. And so the story flows forth of how wrong it is, how terrible it is, how this great justice could be carried out. And somehow, you just, you just out of sympathy, have to agree and say, oh my goodness, I hope somebody does something about that and rights the wrong. Have you ever seen it? Have you ever been part of it? It's easy very quickly to get into the group think, isn't it? And the problem is, as the group considers that matter, that which is maybe easily resolved on an individual level takes on a life of its own. Did you know it's about us? They're mistreating us. And them over there are those that are they. And we and they don't agree. So who's it going to be that gets their way? Us or them? For you see, us is right. Because we know we are. And them is wrong because we know them is. Is that the way life works? Sometimes. It does at times, doesn't it? And somehow, somehow, we vilify in distance. And the word polarize comes to mind. Polarizes the effect. When you're this close and you have a disagreement and you can't work it out, one person goes into the silent mode and drifts back. And then catches its breath or her breath and comes over and says, now wait a minute, you need to discuss this in a rational, rational way. And this person draws back. And this person draws back. And then they enlist their friend. And there's groupthink going on, and they move this way, this way, this way, until they get so far apart that they're not talking to each other. So what do they do then? They have to go to the internet. Did you hear what happened? I have it on reliable sources, who shall never be named. They told me this, and across cyberspace comes the incoming, kapsh, kaboom! And something has to be said about the other. Kaboom! Until they're so far polarized, it's almost hopeless to have it resolved. Have you ever been part of that? Hmm. It's an interesting thing called the human heart. It's so fickle and disruptive at times. Who can trust it? How can we know? Is it us or is it them? You see, it even happens on the broader level. And I want to look at this from the broader level so you can relax for just a few moments. If it's happening on the personal level in your life, you may apply it as necessary and work through the issues as it's applicable. But even in the church, it happens. There was a book written, Adventist Hot Potatoes. And a sequel to that, Adventist More, or More Adventist Hot Potatoes. You've heard about those hot potatoes, haven't you? Those things that people like to discuss. What do Adventists believe about diet? Well, they believe exactly what I believe. What do they think about lifestyle? Well, of course, they agree with me because it's us and everybody else is part of them. 
What about education and legalism and relationships and equal rights for all? What about, well, if you're male and female, how does that work in? What about congregational versus individualism or institutionalism or world needs? What about ethics and moral values? Well, they're off and running, you say. Yes, they are. And which topic shall we take for today? Well, you see, we're not the first group of people to have those interests in those things which we so often will discuss and chew on at potluck or over Sabbath lunch. But we're not the first church that faced those, those issues. We're going through a series in the book of Acts and we're going to look at uh, so that we can learn from the lessons of others the lessons that God would have us learn so that we need not repeat the lessons that are so easily avoided. We have some very smart people in our church, and I'm not talking about just our local church, in our world church. We have some of the brightest intellects. They have their BAs, MBAs, PhDs, Demons, after their name. And they are some of the most intelligent people. I think the top IQ typically is around 200. We have some that are at 300 and 400, I'm sure. But sometimes they lack basic wisdom. Sometimes we're so smart, but we're not wise. We're not always practical. Sometimes I think I've got the answer. And my wife has to sit me down occasionally and say, have you thought about this from the practical side and how it's applied? And I'm already in deep water with all of you. So I'm just going to swim ahead. We have the very best trained members in the world who need to use and apply the training. We have the smartest Bible students in the church, in this congregation today. You have all of the knowledge you need. We have debates and discussion that result sometimes in division and discouragement. Have you seen that? So not so much in our local church, though we have that at times in healthy ways, and that's healthy. But sometimes even on the world church, we have debates and discussions over things that God must, must on one side cry and on the other side smile. How can it be that these are my people and they're spending days and weeks and hours over some of these things? Let me suggest on this long introduction that God chooses and God calls. The only question is how the individual will respond. There's no human affirmation or approval needed for God's actions or God's decisions or God's desires when God calls an individual. That is to suggest and to say when God is moving on your heart and God is moving in your life, follow that leading. Follow the direction of that Holy Spirit. You don't need to ask 16 people what they think about the topic that God is speaking to your heart about. Does that make sense? A moment, a word from God is sufficient to settle it in our individual lives. And sometimes we just press the point as was the case in Acts chapter 15. Let's go there. Let's go there for a little case study so that we not get too close to home, but that we can apply a case study in our lives and learn those lessons. Acts chapter 15, the early church, certain men came down from Judea, which taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
They weren't talking about ta uh, tangential matters of doctrine. They were talking about how is it that Jesus Christ can save you. Verse 2, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Bar Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So the question was, Paul coming from a Jewish background was circumcised. And circumcision was part of the Jewish uh, part of that which was required to be right with God. It was a sign and a covenant with God that you were his. When Christ came, he instituted the circumcision of the heart. He said it's no longer the circumcision of the flesh, but circumcision of the heart. That meaning your heart is given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was a time, there was a dispute in the church. What's required of a person to follow Christ? It was no small matter. If you were to lead somebody into a relationship with Christ and say, you're ready to join our group. You're ready to be part of us. No longer part of them, but part of us. You must be circumcised. And part of them said, no, it's no longer required. So what's it going to be? He said, let's take it up to Jerusalem and see what, uh, what they will say. Verse 5 says, but there rose up a certain sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Verse 7 says, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God made, uh, God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the gospel. And what? And believe. So it was clear the Holy Spirit would speak. They would hear the word of the gospel, they would believe, and they would be part, they would be moved from them into the group called what? Called what? Us. It's either going to be us or it's going to be them. This is a clear case history. There was no place in between in their thinking. There was no room for under, uh, understanding something else or negotiating something else. They were either part of the group accepted by God, part of us, or part of them. How do we think about others today? Do we think about us and by way of comparison, think about them. Well, we have to look at one more quick story in the book of Acts, because it's a book about Peter, who is speaking to this very issue. In Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, we find the story to set the context. Acts chapter 10, um, Acts chapter 10, beginning with verse 10. And Peter, about the sixth hour, became hungry, and he would have eaten. But while, while they made there, he fell into a trance, and he saw heaven opened. And a certain vessel descending upon him, as it were a great sheet, knit with four corners, and let down to the earth. Now remember his background. He sees this sheet coming down from heaven. Wherein all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him and said, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. Supper is on. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. 
Now, many of you have heard and are able to distinguish between the clean and the unclean meats that are listed in the Bible. And he said, no. Uh, this sheet is filled with beasts. He sees in a vision and he hears the voice of God. Arise and kill and eat. And Peter saying, Lord, I've never eaten anything that's un unclean in my life. There's us in them all mixed up in this sheet, Lord. And I've never done that. I'm not, you know, what am I supposed to do? And the voice spake unto him again a second time. What God has cleansed, that call not common. And thus was done thrice, and the vessel was received again unto heaven. And Peter was terribly confused. It would be confusing, wouldn't it, if you were Peter? What is this vision? What does this vision all mean? Later on in chapter 10, verse 28, And he said unto them, You know how it is, it is a... Um, you know how it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come on to one of another nation or another people. But God has showed me that I should not call any what? Any man common or unclean. This vision was not a vision about taking... Uh, it was not a declaration of God to say that there's no, uh, no longer distinguish, uh, distinction between common and unclean meats. This vision was a vision given to Peter to help him realize that everybody around him, those who had, taken, uh, those who had been cast by labeling as common and unclean by us, are no longer to be thought of common or unclean. Because in God, God's sight, He sees it differently. Do you believe that, friends? Do you believe that? Different? Uh, do you believe that? Yes, indeed. We so quickly label. We have, that la we have that label, don't we? Us. We. We got our act together. They and them, if they listen and understand, they surely would get it in about four or five minutes max because we can articulate it so well. And they just don't get it. They don't understand. They are, they are unclean. Don't have anything to do with them because they're living in the prison house of sin and us we don't do that end of story close the conversation and go on your separate ways life is that way isn't it at times but that's not how God sees it. So how does God deal with polarization? When groups of people move way out and they both can bring a multitude of Bible texts. And if it's the number of texts that you need, all you need is one more than your adversary. All you need is one more than the person who thinks differently than, than you do. Or is it an understanding and a prompting of the Holy Spirit? Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive, God, here are the lessons we learn from these two stories. You can jot them down. I'm just going to touch on them. Just going to touch on them. Verse 34, Peter opened his mouth. God views people differently than we view people. Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is, what? No respecter of persons. Hear me very carefully. Hear me very carefully. You should listen to others. But don't be too impressed with their titles. 
All they are is fragments of alphabet before or after their name. Because God is no respecter of persons. Doesn't matter whether you're a deacon in the church, the pastor of the church, whether you're the janitor in the church, whether you're a child or a 72-year-old child or a, an advanced 10-year-old. You're with me, so to speak. God is no respecter of persons. Sometimes some of the smartest, sometimes some of those who hold titles get into debates and draw the church into extended dialogues that there is no answer this side of the kingdom. Have you been there? Second thing. The, the second thing is, God, the first is, God is no respecter of persons when there's polarization. The second thing is, um, verse 35. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 35. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is what? Is accepted by him. So first, God is, is not the respecter of people, but he is, he is accepting those of every nation, every background that fear him and do works of righteousness. Did you catch that? I, I get so troubled over the conversation sometimes. When we start dividing on backgrounds, well, wait a minute, that person comes for, with this view for because of this and that, and we forget. It's only as we come to Christ and fear Him and live a righteous life that we're made whole in Him and have the ability to have conversation with one another that results in unity. The third is that the preaching, preaching peace in Christ will bring forth a healing aspect. Verse 36, the word which God sent unto his children of Israel, preaching peace by Christ Jesus. Oh, it is amazing to me how there will be, there will be such vitrialness in the world that's crept into the church. It's much more subtle. And they would never believe it is vitriol in nature. But I will call it as I see it. And you can tell me you're not on that side of the teeter-totter today afterwards. We can have frank discussions. But we need to make sure that while we do it, we are doing it in kindness. But we're preaching peace by Jesus. The message that we have to carry to a world is the message of peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. The fourth is that Jesus of Nazareth comes with the power of the Holy Ghost and with power. The fifth is in Acts 10.38, it says that they were doing good. The sixth is they were healing all that were oppressed by the devil. The seventh was that God was with him. The eighth is the promise that those who believe in him shall receive the remission of sin. The ninth is in verse 47. Can a man forbid water? Should these not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And the tenth is, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Do you see how the polarization melts away when the Holy Spirit steps in and says, let's look at one another. Let's consider each other in the ways that God considers us. When His Spirit works in our lives, when His Spirit prompts others to give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ to be baptized, who are we to stand in that way? I so humbly ask you today. But let me ask you, there is a certain oddity in the church, isn't there? Because there's the camp. There indeed is us. And there indeed is them. And we that are us are sure we're right with the Lord. And if they would only be right with the Lord also, them would be part of us.
And you can pick your flavor and you can pick your issue. It might be 1988. It might be how you become right with Lord. It might be you're not dressing right. It might be your diet. It might be your discussion. It might be your attitude. It might be any number of things. You can find a camp to join in about five minutes on the web. I say throw all of that trash out of your life. It's the very best counsel I could give you today. And go to the Word of God and say, Lord, what is it you want me to do in my life? How are you going to lead me by your power and by your Word? Because isn't that all that really matters in the end? So, how does God deal with polarization? How to love the un lovable. For you see, when you're polarized, you don't much care for them. You don't much love them. You'd like to, but until they make movement to you, it isn't going to happen. You've been hurt, you've been scarred, you've had your head buried in the sand, you're living in 1910, and they're living today, and all of those things are complex. And we ask the wrong question. And we get the wrong answer every time. Have you found that to be the case? When you ask the wrong question, because God's view of polarization is much different than ours. And God has a remedy for it. It's very quick. It's about three minutes long. It's found in John. And the words are used. I like these words. It, they, 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 they go to my ear. When you accept Christ, He calls you His son or what? Daughter. He calls you His son or daughter. So if we are His son and daughter, what are we to each other? Brothers and sisters. What are we to Him? His what? We're His children. I love children. How about you? There is something great about children, particularly when they're still young. And I mean young by under four. They get pretty sharp about four years old. They get it figured out about three. Uh, they're working mom and dad, and they, their lights are on, and, and things are going on. But at, at three or four years old, they're so innocent. You know, they play together so well. They have no pretensions about pretentiousness about them. They'll just come up, give you a hug, and life is good. John writes, listen to these words. Starting 1 John chapter 2. I believe this is how God deals with polarization. My little children, he writes, my little children. He's not talking about four-year-olds. He's talking about me. He's talking about you if you're listening to the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about us. He's not talking about them. He's talking to his children of all different ages. My little children, these things are right unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Verse 12 of the same chapter, 1 John chapter 2. I write, write unto you, little children, because of your sins are forgiven. You for his name's sake. My little children, it's not us and them. For wait a minute, are his children only in this building? What about those to the right and left in your job site? Those who think radically different than you do. Two more. Little children, it is the last time, and as you've heard, that the Antichrist shall come. Even now, there are many antichrists whereby we know it is the last time. 28 says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteous is righteous, even as he is righteous. My little children, God says, come on to me. 
It's not about us. And it's not about them. It's about being his children and allowing the spirit to work in our lives so that that polarization allows us to see others as Christ sees them. And indeed, they are our brothers and sisters. They are our brothers that Christ died for. They are our sisters that Christ died for. He commanded them, Acts chapter, Acts chapter uh, 10 ends, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed thee him to tarry certain days. The Holy Spirit is working in your heart and in your life and in the lives of each person you come in contact with this week. It's not about us. It's not about them. It's about developing a view, uh, uh, the eyes, the heart of Christ to see them as his children, just as we are his children. And who is anyone else to devalue a child of God? He says, come on to me. I will fill you with the Holy Spirit and fire from above. I will lead you in righteousness. And that's the place to be. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your patience. We thank you, Father, for your leading your long-suffering. Father, we thank you for the lessons of old that we may learn from rather than have to learn firsthand. But at times, Father, in different areas and corners of our lives, we've been polarized, sometimes on the individual level, sometimes as a church on the corporate level, Sometimes as a world church on the world level, we've sent out messages, harmful messages that have devalued individuals based on their background, based on their gender, based on their abilities, based on their titles. But Father, we come with a full realization that you died on the cross for them, and for us. And how dare we not accept your children, our brothers and sisters. So give us that spirit and give us that heart of Jesus. We ask in his precious name. Amen.